My name is John Ross with the Art of Retouching Studio, and this is Behind the Retouching. This particular image was commissioned to me by Advanced Photoshop Magazine for issue number 132. I find that when I write an article and I only have 20 steps in which I need to give this detailed information, I really can't do it. There's just too much stuff I need to communicate. So when I write the articles, the best I can do is truncate it to the core fundamentals of what the most important information is. I like creating these supplemental videos for those that really want to dig into all the details on what it took and all the different things that went through my head as I was actually creating the image and the different things that happened behind the scenes. In this case, they wanted me to write an article about beauty retouching. I sent them a couple images and they selected this one. So let's get started at the beginning with the raw file. Here's the base image as it came out of camera raw. I made some simple color and tonal changes to the image and then I ended up here. Again, I didn't do anything crazy, I just opened up the shadows a little bit, added some more blacks to add the contrast back in and then I pulled down the saturation. Usually my work is overly saturated or at least it has enough visual punch. However, in this case I wanted to pull back a bit because I wanted it to look natural. On the front end, before I worked on the image, I knew they wanted to do a close-up of the image. However, the image itself was actually set back and there's a lot of dead space around it. So now because of this, I knew that I needed to blow up the image about 125% before I ever did any retouching to the image. And I did that inside of Camera Raw, down here underneath the image, where this blue text is. Once you click on it, you can see the settings that I actually used. Generally speaking, I use Adobe RGB for the color space. The bit depth is 16 bits per channel. In this case, I resized to fit at a percentage of 125% at a resolution of 300 pixels per inch. What all this actually means is that I'm gonna get a nice close up on the printed piece and there won't be any banding that will surprise me in the end. So after I was okay with all these settings, I clicked okay, and now I was able to get started, and now I was able to get started in Photoshop. Now the first thing you'll notice is that I rotated the image a little bit so that she was straight up and down. In order to make sure everything was aligned properly, I used guides that was pulled from the ruler. And I'm going to unhide my guides now so that you can see that this is the grid that I gave myself. As you can see, I made sure that the eyes were level, the eyebrows were level, that the nose and the lips were all centered, and that everything was generally lined up properly. So when they did do that nice close-up, everything was going to be flush to the rest of the page. Now there are some things that aren't correct just yet. For example, her lips are hanging over here and not over here. But those are things that I take care of in a later step within this video. But mostly this was a good starting place for me. Now I like to take care of all the technical issues on the front end before I ever get started with the hardcore retouching. And now after I did the rotation and I got the general color balance okay, whenever I work on these studio shots that have this white background that need to remain white, they're never really white. So what I needed to do was cut her out and replace it with my own pure white background. And the way that you do that is actually pretty simple. You need to make a selection of the model. And there are many different ways to actually go about it. A very simple way is to use the magic wand and simply click. And depending on your tolerance and your other settings, it should come right to the absolute edge. At this point, what you can do is click on your quick mask and it will give you this display. You can use your paintbrush and bring it up a bit and then just paint in these other areas. Your settings may differ from mine, but generally speaking, all you need to do is get to this point where you've actually made a selection around the model. And in this case, I need to invert it because I have the background selected, not the model. I'm gonna go select inverse and now that she is selected, what I want to do is go select, modify, expand, and I want to push it away from her skin. And then I'm gonna make this like 25 pixels. I want to make sure it's plenty far enough away from her skin. 
When we zoom in, you can see that it's pushed plenty away from her skin, and then this is going to allow us to cut her out. Now there is technically some difference that may happen in this very limited area, but more than likely you're never ever going to see that. So you can just kind of get away with it. But once you have your selection, you can push this button right there, which is going to give you your layer mask. And when I originally did it, this is my mask. So now you can see it blew away all of this excess background. By creating my own pure white background layer, I can turn that on, and now you can see that I have a nice, clean, white background layer to get started with. If you need to see what that looks like, you can open up your info palette, which is under Window Info, and you can move your cursor around and look over at your RGB values or your CMYK values. If you notice, the RGBs are all 255, and the CMYKs are all zeros. And as you move around the outside, that's exactly what you should see. That means it's pure white. So once I reach this point in the retouching process, I evaluate how the image looks out of Camera Raw. Sometimes I'll go back into Camera Raw and adjust the settings a little bit more. In this case, I actually adjusted it within Photoshop. If you look at this top group here that says OA, that means overall. I just don't like typing that all the time. But inside of here we have a curve. And this curve, when it gets turned on, adds more contrast into the image and makes it just a little bit more dynamic. To see what that looks like, we're going to click on Properties. I'll click on the curve. And I made a generic S-curve. Simply, I brought up the lights and I brought down the darks. Now because Photoshop layers work top down, by putting this overall curve at the top, that means anything that is below it is going to accept that curve. So if I put the curve down here and then I cloned on top of it, then you have a curve in the middle and you can't adjust the curve. You can only go up. In this case, because this is at the very top, I can turn it off, turn it on, and it will not affect the cloning I actually did or any of these other layers that I created. I'm very careful to create my layers in a linear fashion so that I group them together in pieces that hopefully don't overlap each other. For example, if you notice eyes, lips, well they don't touch each other, the overall will cover them so that goes on top. Now at this point, all I really want to do is start cleaning up the image. I start making decisions about what I want to add and what I want to remove. Now in this case, I know that there are a lot of different things that need to be taken care of on a technical level before I ever get into the actual cloning part. Because I'm working off a smart object out of Camera Raw, I don't need to create multiple versions of the background, like copy after copy after copy. Because it's a smart object, all of the filters that I create actually get applied directly to the layer, and I can adjust them after the fact, turn them on, turn them off. If you don't understand how to use smart objects, I have many videos on my website, www.theartofretouching.com, that actually do talk about how to use smart objects. So please take the time to check them out. You will be very thankful that you did. Even if you don't know how to use smart objects, don't worry about it. You can still follow along the rest of this video. It is not smart object intensive. Simply, this layer is a smart object, and I've applied some smart filters, and I'm going to talk about how I applied them now. By using this tick down right here, that's going to show my smart filters. And with smart objects, they work a little bit differently than layers. Layers work from the top down, but smart filters start working from the bottom up. And because Smart Sharpen is at the bottom, that means that that is the first filter that I've applied. So the settings that I used for the Smart Sharpen can be seen by double clicking on the layer. And that's going to bring up the settings. So in this case, I set it to an amount of 200%, a radius of 2%, and a reduced noise of 0%. And that made the image sharp, but not too sharp. The next step I did was portraiture. Now, I know that this is a very touchy subject between different professional retouchers where most would say, oh no, you never should use an automatic program like portraiture, and then you get those that say, well, I can't live without portraiture. Well, here's my point of view on it, that portraiture makes life easy. It will smooth out the skin, 
it will remove the blemishes, and as long as you use it under a controlled situation, there's no need to worry about it doing too much. That's the fear, that you use all the different sliders that they give you because you can use them. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. Once again, I have a video on my website that does explain portraiture with the proper settings that will give you really nice results. So here I'm just going to turn it back on. So now here's the before and here's the after. Here's the before and the after. If you look up in this area, you can see that it just simply fills in a little bit better and it's not nearly as hard with the skin transitions. Once again, very subtle. It's not going to damage the image. Now, the next big step is liquify. The main purpose for this liquify is that these ears on the model are kind of sticking out. She has this elvish look about her. So I use the liquify to simply squeeze in her ears as well as level off her shoulders just a little bit. Here, let me show you. Okay, so here you can see the before, the after, before, and after. And you can also see I adjusted her hair just a little bit. And this last smart filter is the blur gallery. And in this case, I took a little bit of creative license. I found that this image was just too sharp all the way around. And I actually blurred the back of her head a little bit just to give it a little depth of field. And you should be able to see it once I zoom in here. And then we have a before and after. Before and after. And as you can see, it gives it a nice rounded back. So I really think it helps in the believability so it doesn't look like it was cut out from the background. So all these steps are done on a single layer. And that's the benefit of using these smart objects. I don't need to create all these different filters on layer on top of layer on top of layer. Everything works nice and seamlessly off of a single layer, and I can double click on any one of these layers and adjust the settings as needed. So I'm going to click this little tick mark, and now we can move on to the cloning. This is currently the before, and here's the after. Before and after. When it comes to cloning the skin, I often use a simple healing brush, which is right here. It works just like the clone stamp, however, it matches the color and the tone from the source area as well as the destination area. And it just simply allows you to move faster than just using the clone stamp by itself. While I'm here, I'd like to talk about two birthmarks. If I turn off the cloning, you can see that we have this mark here and this mark down here. And when I turn on the cloning layer, you can see that I actually took them out. This was actually a debate I had with myself that went on for a couple days, where basically I prefer the birthmarks in because these two just kind of balance themselves out and it was kind of a symmetry within the face. However, in the end, I did decide to take them out because this is supposed to be a beauty piece and in beauty, all those types of things are usually coming right out. If this was more of a studio piece or you otherwise knew who the model was, then we would need to leave those beauty marks in. But since this is a beauty piece and the model is supposed to represent every woman, in that case they really needed to come out. The next thing I tackled was actually the skin tones. So that layer group is up here at the top. And I'm going to bring that down. And as you can see, I have several different layers that actually made this up. So let's start with these skin shadows. Here's the before and here's the after. Before and after. And if I zoom in really, really close, you can see the type of intricate work that actually gets done when it comes to beauty retouching. The way that you do this is to go pixel for pixel. There really isn't any way to do this better. There are faster ways, but what will often happen is it's just going to smear or smudge or otherwise blend the pixels together. The only way to effectively do this is to select the layer, take a clone stamp, 
and give yourself a very, 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 very tiny brush. Zoom in really close. And basically, all you want to do is just match the tones and have them balance out a little bit. Like, technically, you can see right here, this is darker. So I'm going to use the clone stamp on this lighter area. I'm going to select my source with the Alt key on PC and the Command key on a Mac. And I will come in here with an opacity that's light. It could be 20%, it could be 10%, it could even be 5%. It's completely up to you how many times you want to go over a particular area. For me, I'm happy with 10%. So now I'll just click and drag over the area a couple times. And as you can see, it very subtly removes the blemishes. And yes, this is as subtle as it has to be. And you do this for hours. If you want to do serious professional retouching, this is the way that you do it. So in this case, I went over some darker areas. And now you'll see there's a lighter area in here. So then I'll pick a darker area. And I'll just go right here. And then click and drag over this area a couple times. And that will darken it so that the lighter area and the darker area just kind of match together. And you'll go over the entire image just like this. It's tedious, it's time consuming, and it will take hours. But this is the proper way to do it. This is how all the beauty advertising is done. There's different techniques, everyone has their own style and their way of working, but generally speaking, this is how it gets done. Nose shadow, well that's this entire thing down here. It was just too dark, so I simply lightened it by using a, a simple curve that just lightened that area. And here's another curve. Now these next two layers I picked up from the website VibrantShot.com where Michael has videos and actions on how to do beauty retouching. I highly recommend you check that out as well, which again was VibrantShot.com. So what these two layers do in this case is it does a little bit of sharpening and reduction of the shine that's going on up here in the forehead. So let me show you. So here you can see that this is the area that I have selected. It simply reduces the amount of detail that goes on in those particular areas because it was just too strong and I wanted to make it a little bit more subtle. And down here, this one is this area through here. I actually wanted to sharpen her freckles. So once again, this is to reduce the amount of detail that's going on, and this one is to sharpen the detail that's going on. Basically, I just really just wanted to pull out her freckles. They were a characteristic that I thought was visually interesting. So now the next layer that I wanted to take care of was her nose, because there's too much shine going on. Once again, this is the type of thing that some people would enhance, and I'm someone that would reduce. I don't want to pull my attention into somebody's nose. That's just the way that I am. So in this case, I'm going to reduce the nose shine, which looks like this. Now this is selective color. And by selecting the whites with a mask that looks like this, it allows me to add a little bit of tone into that area because if you just use a curve, it's just going to gray it out. However, with the selective color, we can add the color back in just so it blends a little bit better. As I was working, I noticed that her ears were a little bit red. And that happens when the light comes from behind. You'll see the blood vessels in the ears and it makes it look red or pinkish. So in this case, I used selective color once again, but I used the reds in order to pull this color out of the ears. So this is the before and this is the after. Before and after. The next thing I wanted to work on was the lips. Now, not only do they look a little bit uh, crusty or crinkly or something, you know, the shine just wasn't there. It wasn't a very nice glistening thing. It's just kind of there it is and, you know, whatever. So I took several different steps in order to achieve a nice soft glistening look. Now the bottom layer that's in here is lip shadow. And if you notice that 
it originally has this highlight underneath. So I added a shadow just to give it this blending in. Basically, I really just felt that these lips just kind of hovered above the skin. It just never really felt to me like they were attached to her face. And I never cared for this lipstick color anyway. So I simply took care of attaching it as one of the early steps. So the lip shadow is that with simple curve. And the next few layers are described at vibrantshot.com. And he also has a YouTube video and it describes how to do lips. So this is a technique of his that I've adopted and I'm simply giving him a shout out for putting together all the excellent videos that he does. So in this case, we have a Gaussian blur of nine. Here we have a high pass with an apply layer. And here we have a high pass. And here we have an high pass, which was inverted. Now due to the time constraints of this own video, I'm not going to go into detail on how it's done, but please go check out Michael's channel on YouTube. And you can also see how this was done in great detail. Now these next three layers that we have inside of the lips are images of lips that I picked up and placed inside of my own document at different opacities and different blend modes, as well as different distortions. So let me turn this one back to a base and then you can see what it originally looked like. Okay, so I simply took lips that I found that I liked and I applied varying effects to them and it simply adds a subtle glistening to my own image. And so here was the second one that I added before and after. And here's the third one I added before and after. And now at this stage, you can see that these lips are not very even. You know, you can see the bumpies that are going on around the outside of this. So I simply have a layer that I cloned a little bit around the outside to even them out. And since I've never been a fan of these bright red lips, here I've adjusted them with a hue saturation layer. And when I click on it, you can see I did a colorize and I adjusted the hue, saturation, and the lightness. And in the end, it gave me this lighter pink color which I generally felt matched her skin tone a lot better than the bright red, which is subjective and of course to each their own. And lastly, I worked on the eyes. And lastly, I worked on the eyes. Often that's the first thing I'm working on, but for whatever reason, I took my time and I worked on all these other areas first. And then when it came to the eyes, I did those last. So what we have here is another clone layer of the eyelashes and the eyebrows before and after, before and after. I simply filled in different areas in the eyebrows just so they had nice rounded edges. And then I filled in on the eyelashes as well on the top and bottoms so that they were nice and full. Now these next two layers represent a replacement of the iris. I straight up replaced the irises. I took a picture of my wife and I enhanced the detail in them and I placed them inside of this image here. So here is the right iris and here is the left iris. So basically I needed to replace them because it had this shine that was coming from the reflector that was bouncing light up and I can't adjust this, so I simply had to replace it. These are both smart objects because I have the original raw files inside of there, and then I have a mask that just gave it a nice soft edge. And generally speaking, these eyes were just a little too bright when I brought them in, so I added a curve to simply darken it before and after. And lastly, I added a hue saturation layer to this. Let me back out a little bit so you can see. Uh, a general conversation that happened behind the scenes was that it looked like she was doing a soap ad, but she was wearing lipstick. So it just seemed like a disconnect. So I balanced it out a little bit with a subtle hue saturation, which gave her some eyeshadow. 
So if I click on the layer itself, you can see the settings that I used. Again, it just helps balance out the image as well as conceal her eyelashes a little bit, which were a little bit distracting as well. So now at this point, it looks like this is the entire image and that we are finished with the retouching, but that's not exactly true because as I finished the retouching, I showed it to some others and I got other comments back and I incorporated what I could into this file. There were some things that required multiple layers to be adjusted at the same time using Liquify. So that meant I couldn't work on them in this particular file working with all these different layers. So rather than doing the keyboard command referred to as the claw, which is shift control alt E and then similar on the Mac, which is like command option shift E whatever, you know, uh, which flattens all the layers and creates a new layer. In this case, I simply grabbed all of these layers, right clicked and I went convert to smart object. And that simply takes everything, puts it into a container, and then allows me to move forward while working on everything at once as a self-contained entity. So after I do that, I get a file that looks the same. However, it's contained into a single layer. It was finally at this point that I actually cropped the image. So yes, during this entire process, I had the entire background showing. I don't actually crop until the very end. In many cases, I don't even crop then. But in this case, I knew I didn't need all that extraneous white space. I simply cropped it. But now the reason that I did this whole smart object thing is because I needed to do some extra work that covered the gamut of all the different layers put together. So once again, by clicking the little tick down here, you can see my smart filters. And you can also see that I have a mask applied to these smart filters. The mask is allowing the white and masking out the black. So the white part that's showing is her head and the part that it's masking out is her neck and shoulders. So these two effects are only affecting her face. So these two smart filters are only affecting her head and her hair. The first obvious thing I did was bring her hairline down. This is before and after, before and after. So during conversation, it was that her forehead was too big. And then the other thing that I worked on was her lips and her general jawline. So if I zoom in a little bit, you can see that I've simply straightened out her lips a bit and fixed her jawline as well. When I was working on the image and I was zoomed in, I felt that this was just a little bit soft. I thought that if I gave it a little bit more punch, then that would enhance all the little hairs that were going on. And I enabled this last filter of Smart Sharpen. Here's the before and the after. Before and after. So as you can see, it just gave it that little extra punch that it needed. And now the image is nice and crisp and clean. So thank you for watching this behind the retouching video with me, John Ross for the Art of Retouching Studio. And if you would like to learn more about advanced Photoshop retouching, please go to www.theartofretouching.com where you can learn more tips and tricks to make you a better photo retoucher.